good to see Peg Hamilton being ordained because it was her husband who ordained myself and Richard Claycomb in August 31st, 1997. So that means Richard's getting old. <laughs> that was a long time ago. If you turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2, Scott has promised me that this mic's going to give me problems, and so I was hoping to prophecy would come to pass, but if it does, we'll switch to the microphone. Matthew chapter 2. It's rare to go into a church now, and I speak of many, to go into a church where the worship songs are actually doctrinal, like they were today. And also where people have Bibles. Most, most, most of the singing is not doctrinal. And most of the churches nowadays, the modern church, does not have the Word of God. They use other sources. So it's, it's disheartening because I grew up in at Central Avenue where we had Bibles. It was it 61st Avenue where we had Bibles? It wasn't <laughs> Scott's prophecy come to pass? <laughs> And was part of that move at 61st Avenue and sold that church to Covenant International Church and then moved to 51st and Bell and then moved to 41st and Greenway and then moved to 41st and Union Hill. And uh, we're done. This is it. <laughs> this is where we're going to stop. But in Matthew chapter 2, I've entitled today's message, Wise Men Follow Jesus. Would you... Look at your neighbor and say, wise men follow Jesus. And you men look at your spouse and say, wise women follow wise men who follow Jesus. <laughs> Is it okay if we just read the word for a little while and just, let, and just read God's word and, and instead of social media and what Lord Fauci has to say? Let's see what the Lord Jesus Christ has to say. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod, the king, heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from what them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me so that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. And there and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I call my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem in all districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentations, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel, weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. And when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. 
And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. And we hear this narrative, and if you go past any of the mega churches or anything, uh, most of the pastors, they have their sermons for a whole year. Uh, praise God. I don't know how you get your sermons for a whole year. I don't know how you would know that in advance. I, I, I struggle just daily to seek God's word and see what the now word is today, let alone to be able to know what you're going to preach a year from now. But um, in December, you will see a narrative start to take place. And either Matthew chapter 2 or Luke chapter 2 will come into play because of the effect and reign of Constantine and the marriage of the Protestant church with the Catholic Church, and uh, they'll come up with this uh, December 25th narrative, and before, let me give you a pre, pre, precursor and a disclaimer, I believe in Christmas, I believe that the incarnation is as great a miracle as the creation, and I believe the incarnation is as great a miracle as the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and so when God struck a tent of human flesh and dwelt among us, and it was Emmanuel, God with us, I believe that that is a sacred time, and I believe that the kinsman redeemer of the Old Testament being fulfilled in the New Testament, and everything that the prophets, the 300 prophecies that were going to come to pass, it was important because how many of you know the Bible says, obey God's prophets and you will prosper. And here the prophets are prophesying in Jeremiah 31 of these different passages, and these prophecies are coming to pass, especially here in chapter 2. And being that we're in the time frame right now where probably is the time frame of the birth of Christ, and because of the weather patterns, uh, I did about a, probably a nine-page thesis on the birth of Christ and studied the weather, weather patterns all the way back to Jerusalem from 2,000 years ago. And our best guesstimation is that Christ was probably, get best guesstimation is probably September 29th. However, we know that because the feasts that are going to be fulfilled, you have Rosh Hashanah, or the Feast of Trumpets. And in the Old Testament, two silver trumpets were blown, and they were blown a hundred times. And silver in the Bible always represents redemption. And how many know Jesus is our Redeemer? And so silver is redemption. If you went to the Old Testament, you went to the tabernacle, wherever, you'd see these silver sockets. And it didn't matter where you started. If you followed those silver sockets and those chains, it would always come back around to the front, to the door, to Jesus. I am the door of the sheep. And this first trumpet that was blown, the first silver trumpet, was a type and shadow of the birth of Christ. That there would be a trumpet blown, and that would be the birth of Christ. And then the second trumpet would represent the return of Christ. And even though we don't know the day or hour, and if anybody tells you they know the day and the hour, grab your hat and run. A lot of theologians would tell you they know when Christ is going to return. But theologians are blind men in dark rooms looking for black hats that don't exist, and they're trying to convince you and I they found them. Uh, you have to get that on the tape. But no, no man knoweth the day or the hour, and it's been reserved to the Father. But he says, we'll even know when it's at the door. And so if you don't know that we're in a season where this is probably the end of the end times, whether that's five years or 50 years or 100 more years, uh, we're still in the end times. And we see those signs that are showing us that it has come, the, the rapid militant agenda, a homosexual agenda. You cannot go anywhere anymore where this is not crammed down your throats as an alternative lifestyle and being born that way and all these different uh, narratives to make you accept this and different other things and politics and everything that's happening now and uh, ep economic social upheaval and the politics and pestilences and plagues and social media and the knowledge of increase, you get the increase of knowledge. You can see this anywhere. So it's kind of strange to go to a traditional narrative which pe would put people mostly into eggnog and a good feeling. But don't let the traditions of men make God's word null and no effect and take away the power of what really was happening in Matthew chapter 2. Because in the scriptures it says there's wise and there's Foolish. In Romans it says, professing to be wise, they became fools or they became morons. And they, like zombies, and they changed the image of God into a corrupt thing or a four-legged animal. And they worshiped the creation instead of the creator who's praised forevermore. Henceforth, not the devil, not a DNA structure, but God gave them up and God gave them over. And God Release them to themselves as they have false worship, which is the root of all the other sins, including homosexuality. Can you say amen? amen? If you worship the creation instead of the creator who's praised forevermore, you'll be shocked what you'll be turned over to. 
And it's God that's going to get you up. It's God that's going to get you over. And you can blame the devil. You can blame your monster-in-law. You can blame whoever you want to. But it's God that gave them up. That's what the scripture says. And it says that uh, Pastor Price used to sing this jingle. I got saved at 25 and went to Valley Cathedral on May 25th, 89. I was part of that guard that came in. So I was at the charismatic movement. And uh, he first one of the first things he sang, which I had never heard, is he sang in the pulpit at 6225. He would get up and he'd say, the wise man built his house upon the rock. And he would go through that whole thing and he would sing at, at his double word octave. And, uh, <laughs> And he would say that the house on the rock stood firm. And then he talked about the foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the house on the sand would, and he'd hit the pulpit and say, splat. And I just remember that sticking to me, never being in church or never hearing the name of Jesus. And I thought, who is this rock and how do we build on that? And I realized that there was a difference between a wise man and a foolish man. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. And Proverbs tells us over and again, happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. How much better to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. That their hearts may be encouraged, be knit together in love, and attain to all the riches, the full assurance of the understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, and who are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And not only is there a difference between what is wise and what is foolish, and there's a contradistinction and a contrast, but God also says there is also a good wisdom, a heavenly wisdom that comes down from above. And on the wisdom side, there's an earthly, sensual, and there's a demonic wisdom. That there's a good wisdom and a bad wisdom, and then there's wisdom, and then there's foolishness, and the scriptures are full. He, it tells us in Corinthians, it tells us in these things, and James tells us that that wisdom that doesn't come down from above, that's first pure, that is earthly, it's sensual, and it's demonic. It starts out what seems to be like a natural wisdom evolution, and then it turns sensual, and it titillates the intellectualism, and then it goes demonic, and then you start believing you evolved from an ape. I told somebody, if you believe you've evolved from an ape, maybe you did. I don't know. But I don't believe I evolved from an ape, and I don't want you to tell my kids they did. And so, uh, so be it according uh, to your faith. And so James tells us about this earthly, sensual, demonic. And like anything that starts out natural or starts out uh, uh, the desire to have food is godly. But how many know that it will turn sensual on you and it gets emotional and then it can turn demonic to where you can't control your eating habits? And we see that in sexuality, we see that in eating, we see that in watching TV, that uh, it, you, know, you, you don't want to become a legalist, but at the same time, it's really easy to become a pagan. And so this wisdom comes, and he says, walk circumspectly. It's a picture of a man on a, uh, a wire, and he's trying to be balanced, and he has a rod in his hand, and he's tightrope walking, and he's trying to keep his balance, and the, the rod is the thing that's helping him keep his balance. And, Solomon said, hold on to one without letting go of the other. And one thing that Jesus taught, one thing that my spiritual father always taught, and that was the theme of Valley Cathedral that we've inherited into our ministry that's birthed out of here, is balance and moderation. Not tolerance, but balance and moderation. And it just seems like in the body of Christ now that there's no balance and there's no moderation. It's either radical out one way or it's radical out the other way. And there's no in-between and there's no balance and there's no moderation. And I believe that Jesus talk balance and moderation, and I believe it's an earmark of our pastor's ministry over these 50, 60 years. I've never heard him preach anything but balance and moderation. I don't know if I'm getting any amens on that, but that's, that's the way that uh, I saw it. It's Corinthian in the letters and the epistles, Paul tells us that God's most foolish thought is superior to man's greatest thought. God's most foolish thought is billion and eons times superior to man's most intellectual thought. And that his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. As the heavens are higher than earth, so are his ways higher than our ways and his thoughts than our thoughts. Regardless of what you're seeing in social media, don't believe your lying eyes. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is still in total control of this thing. He's not panicking. He's not getting freaked out. None of the above. It's running right along course. It's running the way it's supposed to be. Did you know that Jesus is not concerned if America is written in Revelation or not? If America is mentioned in Revelation, 
I want to tell you something. You can't blot it out. And if America is blotted out of Revelation, you can't write it in. Amen. But you can follow Jesus. Amen. We're going down some weird paths now. And we're going down some strange. People are rallying now to strange causes. Have you noticed that? Yes. We're rallying now to strange causes. And, and we, we're on Facebook, but we don't have our face in this book. And you have to be careful now because this stuff is being twisted and turned and deception is now the rule of the land. And until you get into the word of God for yourself, there is a dynamic that comes from reading God's word. And there is a Holy Ghost revelation that comes from the reading of God's word, not on a screen, not on a phone, but in hard no study of the word of God. That's a blessing to your life. We got nine Bibles in our houses and we choose to use another method. I don't know why we wouldn't just stick. This thing's not broken. And what did my grandpa used to say? If it ain't broke, don't try to fix it. But the Bible says get wisdom and get understanding and understand the contrast. There are good walls in scripture and there are bad walls in scripture. Nehemiah preached about good walls and rebuilding the walls. And violence shall no longer be heard in your land, nor than wasting your destruction in your borders. But your walls shall be called salvation, and your gates praised. There are good walls in Scripture, but how many know there are bad walls in Scripture? Jericho, they marched around these walls, these fortified city walls, and this ancient hatred and all these things that were keeping them from the promises of God. Any wall that's keeping you from your promised land, that's keeping you from the promises of God, you need to march and keep your mouth shut and march around those walls until you get to that 13th lap, the 7th lap, on the 7th day after 6 days of one lap, and shout and see those walls coming down. Those are bad walls, and those walls have to come down. And the same, the same with the, the seed that goes into the ground. There's a seed that goes into the ground. This is seed eater month. And there's a seed that goes in the ground. And mice come and birds come. And the seed is a demonic seed. And it comes and it ruins your harvest. And it says that these mice and these different birds come at this time there. And they actually eat that seed and take it away. It's nutrients to them. But it keeps your harvest clean. But it's a bad seed. But it also says that if we tithe, God will rebuke the devourer. And it means he'll rebuke the seed eater. See, there's a seed eater that when we're planting good ground, when we're in Tierra Buena, when we're in good ground and we have good seed, there's also the devourer who comes and he wants to take that seed out of the ground. The bird there wants to snatch that seed out of the ground. And there's good seed and there's bad seed. Can you say amen? amen. So these wise men are going to follow Jesus. And the first thing in the narrative, if you've been in tradition like I have, and and had, your, had a stint with uh, uh, Pastor Barnett getting ready to do his 85th birthday next year. But uh, you automatically, a tradition of men and what is a narrative that's by men. And how many know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and growth comes from seeing and maturity comes from doing. But if you hear something, you retain 10% of it. But if you hear and you see it, you retain 20 to 30% of it. So when we see things, it can actually, to where when we read the word of God, we can... Look right at the word of God and it says nothing. When the word of God says wise men, the Greek is magoi. It's M-A-G-O-I. It means a caravan of at least 20 people. But what we do is, is they were to bring three gifts, frankincense, and they were supposed to bring myrrh, and they were supposed to bring gold. So automatically, traditionally, we see three men coming in on a camel at church, and they got these big hats on, and they're bringing three vials of whatever it is to bring to, to the king, to, to the child. Are you with me? And that's imprinted in our head. And the first thing we talk about is, hey, has anybody heard? remember the three wise men? Well, that's fine. That's not a problem. There was at least three wise men, but there was a caravan of wise men. These were anemic people who were coming from far off, who were poor. And they were dragging their duffel bag and barely making it. Where's this child? Because we got to get to him. No, these were rich, wealthy, wise men. They were uh, oriental scientists. They had studied constellations. They understood that the Virgo or the Virgin constellation was a picture of a woman in August who would have had uh, been birthing and been 
ready to breastfeed and she was ready to give birth and they saw what would have been like a comet or a star that as lightning strikes from the east to the west so will be the coming of the son of man and from the east they saw this star take off and they knew if they got to that point of destination that the baby was the child was right there and if they could get to the child they would get to the king they were wise men who knew they were sinners who needed a savior and they were going to get to the king and they were going to go the distance for the king. They were going to forsake all to get to the king. They weren't just bringing a vial of gold and a little vial of myrrh and a little bit, bit of whatever and little trinkets. They came with treasures. They opened up their treasures. And this caravan of Magi gave freely and openly to the king of kings and the lord of lords. And if you see that narrative, that changes the anemic. That changes the tradition. That changes this uh, poverty mentality that these guys, how these guys were coming and this narrative scene where it's three camels and three wise men and that's it. No, these are oriental scientists. These are people who are studied. These are people who are educated. These are people who are rich. These are people who know with what they saw in the constellations and what was studied. If they could get to that point of destination, they would know that that's where the king is there. The first thing they run into when, it, when they're searching for the king is the first thing that we're going to run into. They run into Herod when they first want to see the king. And they run into what is a conniving politician, a little fox, a vixen. And what does Herod say? He says what all presidents say. I want to follow Jesus too. When you find out where Jesus is, he's not going to go himself. But when you wise men find out where this Jesus is, come and tell me because I want to follow Jesus also. Is that not what Matthew 2 says? But what does it say in Matthew 2? When he really found out where the king was and his position of authority was going to be challenged. See, there are different kinds of followers. There are conniving politicians who say, I follow Jesus. But at the same time, they sign executive orders of infanticide to kill all the kids under two years old. Anytime their position of authority is challenged, no matter what it is, they'll follow Jesus up to that point. But if their position of authority is challenged, then they'll kick Jesus out and anybody who is part of Jesus' crew or any prophets or anybody who could challenge their position of authority. And you say, thank God that only happens in politics. That doesn't happen in the church. <laughs> thank God that only happens at my job. That would never happen at my church. But there is a Herod following, a Herodian following, that will always follow Jesus as long as their position of authority, their title, their finances are not challenged. They'll worship him too. But if that's challenged, then they'll come out with a directive on one side, kill all the infants under two years old. So we see the kind of follower that Herod is. Wise men come from the east to the west. Wise men seek out and find Jesus. Wise men submit to Jesus. They worship him, it says, not them. Mary's there. Jesus is there. But it says they worship him, not them. Him alone. Jesus is to be worshipped alone. Wise men worship Jesus alone. Wise men forsake all to follow Jesus. Wise men understand the times they live in. They're like the tribe of Issachar in the Old Testament who understood the times. I was wondering if anybody here in here understands the times. Or are we so asleep at the switch that we want our Babylonian houses and we want our Babylonian cars and we want our Babylonian grandchildren and we want all of Babylon and we're hunkered down so much in Babylon that when the prophets come and say we're going back to Zion, will we really come back to Zion or is there only about 50,000 out of 700,000 that really want to come home? Amen. Amen. It got quiet now because, hey, I'm, I'm like you. I live in a million-dollar house, too, and I got a $50,000 Toyota. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to depart with that. I mean, I want to go to heaven, but not today. I'd like to enjoy I'd like to see if the sons are really going to win and uh, how this thing's all going to pay. Just me or... But how many of you know that Egyptian bondage is one thing, but Babylonian captivity is another thing? It's easy to want to get out of Egypt. You're getting beat to death and you can barely make it. But when you're in Babylon where the credit cards are flowing, the cars are flowing, the houses are flowing, and you got it all going on, it's not so easy to just say, hey, anybody want to follow Jesus today? If I could follow from the couch, but I don't want to follow if it's going to cost me anything. Yeah. Wise men forsake all and they brought their treasures with them. They left their homes. Yeah. Wise men are sojourners on earth and they're just passing through. This earth is not their home. They're temporary residents. They know their bums under a bridge just looking for a piece of bread. And if they can find it, they might try to help you find it. 
Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also comes in the pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. Did you know that you'll live to be, the Bible says, 70 or 80 in your strength? And it says the last 10 years will just be toil, trying to get along between shots and wheelchairs and different things. It says you'll live to be 70, 80 in your strength. If you go to any obituary column and you take the amount of deaths and how old they are and divide it, it'll land between 70 and 80. And how would Moses, the man of God, pin Psalm 90 and 91 in David's songs and know that that's what the lifespan is going to be? And now James is right. We're not even guaranteed tomorrow because we don't know of COVID. We don't know if a car wreck. We don't know if cancer. We don't, we don't know what's going to hit us now. Yeah. Aren't you glad we're kind of going into the, into the board text where, hey, I think I'll follow Jesus, you think? Because I think you're out of options. <laughs> <laughs> wise men are not intimidated by other wise men. Why are we surrounding ourselves with people who have the same gift or no gift at all? We should be surrounding ourselves around people that have great gifts or better gifts than we got so we can do this thing together. Amen. Wise men ask, seek, and knock. It's the glory of the Lord to conceal a matter. The kings search it out. Wise men know what gifts to bring. Did you know these wise men, they knew what to bring? How, why? Why bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh? I, I can think of other gifts to bring a king. I don't know if they would be offensive. But wise men bring frankincense and they bring myrrh. And wise men bring gold. But before we talk about the wise men and what they bring, let me touch again about inherit Because I think we hit a hot spot there with conniving politicians. Not that we've never had any in America. <laughs> But Herod will protect his position of authority at any cost, at any cost, including murder. You say, well, I would murder someone to protect my position of authority. Would you defame their character? Would you make up a lie? Would you do something to murder their, their integrity? King Saul, this is a follower of Jesus. And King Saul would follow God. It says that even when I was little in my own eyes, even then didn't I make you king over all of Israel. And it says the people wanted a king like the world wanted a king. But God says, I'm going to give you that, but I'm still going to pick him. And God picked Saul. And if Saul would have kept to follow the Lord, he would have been fine. But Saul had another agenda. He had pride and he presumption and he started out humble. But when he got a few victories under his belt. See, thank God we never got a few victories under our belt as novice Christians. And once we got a few victories under our belt, we were just more humble, weren't we? No. We were wondering why we didn't get the new business card. We were wondering when Pastor Price was going to get to the revelation to give me my title and my parking spot and me and mine and that Absalom spirit. And King Saul, he would follow Jesus as long as he had popularity in the eyes of the people. Herod wanted his position of authority protected. Saul wanted popularity in the eyes of the people. And when he had lost that anointing and that thing had been stripped from him, what did he say? Samuel, if you'll just come out and be with me, I've lost the anointing. I, I, I can't follow Jesus anymore. But if I can hook onto your elbow, if I can hitchhike onto your anointing, the people will accept me and I'll have popularity in the eyes of the people. The cure for that King Saul mentality is just Mephibosheth 101. When Mephibosheth is getting ready to get back the inheritance, he tells David, let Ziba have all I want you. When's going to be the time where we could just say the blessings of God are great, but I want to get back to the blessing. I want to get back to the heart of worship. I want to get back to the heart of the Father. I want to get back to Jesus where Jesus is enough. It'll cure King Saul following. There were two thieves on the cross that wanted to follow Jesus. And what's interesting about these thieves on the cross is the thieves on the cross represent all of humanity and mankind, past, present, and future. And on that middle cross represents the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
He is the one way to the Father. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved, but at the name of Jesus. To be a follower of Jesus, you're going to have to be narrow-minded. You're going to have to have your brain washed. And you're going to have to be prejudiced and prejudged any other doctrine that tells you you can get to the Father any other way than Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You are going to be so politically incorrect. You are going to be so persecuted for it when you do it God's way. And you don't have to be ugly about it. Just be truthful about it and they'll call you ugly. Even if you're pretty. <laughs> but these two thieves on the cross represent all of mankind, past, present, and future. They're ground zero. They're both thieves on the cross. And when you go to the Greek rendering, do you know what thief on the cross means? It means thief on the cross. <laughs> And the one thief was no better than the other thief. They were both thieves. And this one man, this thief on the cross, he didn't protect his position of authority, wanted to be popular in the eyes of people. He wanted preservation in his present crisis. Aren't you glad that you've never met any Christians? They get super spiritual and they will knock down these church doors on Sunday when they're in a crisis. But let God cure that crisis. And you will not see them in church. You will not hear them call the prayer line. You will not see them on their face before God. They can only follow Jesus if he'll give them preservation in their present crisis. Yes. Amen. I'm getting smiles out here, Pastor. And I got women going to their purses and I hear guns. They're right. <laughs> Second Amendment right girls. They're, they're getting ordained and they're ready to shoot the pastor. But to present, protect that position of authority, to be popular in the eyes of people. And now that preservation in that present crisis, this thief on the cross says to the God of the universe, save yourself. Come down from there and save us and show the people what kind of God you are. Isn't that our prayer when we're in that crisis? Show yourself strong, God. Switch, flip the switch, do something, create a miracle, get rid of this president, bring the other president back, get rid of COVID-19. How many, how many penguins and parakeets did you see on Christian television that got up and said, I rebuke the spirit of COVID-19 off of this country. And if that doesn't work, give us a vaccine, Lord. Well, which is it? <laughs> which is it? Because COVID-19 wasn't rebuked off the nation, and most of the time the vaccine doesn't work. So... Throw, give us a dog mask? What's next? What's next? If your faith is to wear the mask, wear the mask. But if your faith isn't, don't be down on me. If your faith is to get a vaccine, get a vaccination. But don't be down on me. I caught one of the first hundred cases of Delta variant. I caught that on June 10th. I was down for seven weeks. I saw dead. I went to the Mayo Clinic. I got the Regeneron treatment. I smelt it and tasted it. I got it. I never got vaccinated. I didn't get vaccinated afterwards. That's where I was in my faith. But I'm not down on you if you wanted to get it. My spiritual father, I told him, go get the vaccine. He caught COVID anyway. He died on my shift. You know what that's like to carry that? To know you were maybe the executioner because you told somebody 78 years old that was overweight, hey, go ahead and get the vaccine because I'd rather risk the vaccine over you dying. And he died anyway. What do you do? You have to go back to realize that God chose you. That we're sealed in sovereignty. We're planted in predestination. Amen. We give our life to providence and we give our soul to the grace of God. Amen. And though he slay us, yet will we trust him. Amen. We have to come back to that. We're forced to come back to that. It's by default if you're really his. This other thief on the cross, pastor, was an interesting character because he wanted Christ to save himself. Can you imagine telling the God of the universe who came to die and when Peter would, did not want him to die, he said, get behind me, Satan, you're a stumbling block. And here's a thief on the cross who knows he's a thief on the cross, but he says, forget all that. Save yourself, save us, let's get down from here and let's have a revival. There's another thief on the cross. Now remember, all mankind is in here. You're either that thief or you're the other thief. You say, well, I've never cussed, smoked, or stole anything in my life, really. Like the rich young ruler, I've kept the commandments. I've never committed adultery. I've never stolen. I've never done all these things. And God, Jesus doesn't say, hey, you liar, liar, heads on fire. He just says, wait a minute. i got to put my thumb on this cat. He says, sell all your riches. Give to the poor. Take up your cross and follow me. And then the rich young ruler said, money is my God. And he, he retracted from his self-righteousness and his law keeping. 
Well, this other thief on the cross, he was different. He would be what you call a born-again Christian now. And this other thief on the cross says something to Jesus. And the other thief, he says to the other thief, Hey, fellow, we deserve to be here. We're thieves. This man has done nothing wrong. We deserve what we've got. We were born in sin and iniquity. We were born in depravity. We know we're sinners. I know that I'm a sinner. And he confesses that he is a sinner. And he confesses to the other guy, this man doesn't deserve this. We deserve this. And Jesus says something to this man that is so powerful. He says, surely today you'll be with me in paradise. And I don't know about you, but I'm my... I'm the kind that want to investigate. Because I'm just like, if I was at the gates of heaven and this thief on the cross comes up and he says, I'm sitting at the gates and I'm like, wait a minute, dude. I don't remember you getting baptized in water. <laughs> Did, does Church of God Cleveland know you're here? <laughs> does Missouri and the AG know you're here? Are you TBN approved? <laughs> I know. Someone told you through an earphone the justification by faith alone message. You got that through your earpiece and you knew it was just by faith alone and grace that you could come to heaven. And can you imagine talking to this guy? Because I would want to ask him, how did that all pan out? What's your doctrine? What was your church affiliation? When did you get baptized? When did you confess? When did you, when did you do all the things that we know that we've had to go through and what we've had to do? When did all that stuff happen? And I could just see this guy saying, I never belonged to a church. I've never been baptized in water. I don't know the doctrine of justification by faith. I didn't know Jesus was God. The thief on the cross, why are you here? I don't know, but the man on the middle cross said I can come. Right. If you get to heaven, friends, it's just simply the man on the middle cross said you can come. The proclamation of faith saved the thief on the cross. The fact he told it the way it really was. He didn't try to measure up or say, I should come because his thieves, his thefts are a lot worse than mine. He stole a car. I only stole the bubble gum. <laughs> Obviously, you wink at bubble gum death with Jesus. But see, that's what religion does. It always makes you take another run at Mount Sinai. Because your pet peeves that you've never broken. Well, I've never really lusted after this or done after that. Lose a few pounds, you might lust. <laughs> well, I've never stolen anything. Yeah, you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth, and God provided everything through your parents and circumstances, so you never faced that gauntlet. But I'm tired of we were born that way. If you're born an adulterer and a murderer, which I was, if I do that, they want to put me in prison. But if I say I was born another way, I get a grace card because somehow my DNA chains tweak. And see, all of sin would fall short of the glory of God. I don't have any problem with any of it. If, if you're a fornicator, adulterer, adulterer, homosexual, sodomite, thief, covetous, drunkard, reveler, extortioner, whatever your cup of tea is, man, hey, that's, I get it. But when you tell me you were born that way and you get a free pass and I don't, then I got a problem with you. Just me? The thief on the cross, one wanted to protect his position of authority, one wanted to preserve himself in his present crisis, one wanted popularity in the people's eyes, but one proclamated, made a proclamation of faith for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth Articulation is made unto salvation. But the scripture says, whoever believes on him shall be saved. Amen. And this thief on the cross called on the Lord. Don't you remember when you got saved? Didn't you just call on him? You called on him, didn't you? And after you called on him, he saved you. Then you knew, got to church, repentance. Maybe I should repent. And it was a gift. It's been a gift from the beginning, your salvation experience, the way he's kept you and the way he'll take you and sanctify you completely on the other side. You've been a miracle from day one. 
In the Old Testament, miracles galore. No one thought nothing of it. But if you said your sins were forgiven, they freaked out. Now, everybody wants to freak out to try to see a miracle. And they're just lying signs and wonders chasing around Polly Parrot. But we just, forgiveness of sins is just passe. Isn't it interesting how the script gets flipped? I'm closing, Pastor. Three wise gifts. Tell your neighbor the three wise gifts. There's three prerequisites to present wise gifts. And the prerequisites are you come to him alone, Jesus. It's him alone. Number two, you fall down before God. This is the only way in the Old Testament the word barek is used to bless. We used to sing songs at Valley Cathedral. Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in this holy place and bless the Lord. Come bless the Lord for thy loving kindness is better than life. We would just go off. We would sing in Glendale. We would sing on Central Avenue. Jesus was lifted up and people just got saved and people brought money. I never remember Pastor Christ preaching on time. He's the only pastor that got off the hook on that. He never had to ask for money. When I got the ministry, you had to remind the people to obey. And Betty Wendy ever asked for money on Central Avenue? He never asked for money. They just brought it and flooded the money everywhere. He's my spiritual father, but it gave him the ability to harass and talk down on all the people who got to beg for it. What y'all begging for? Well, yeah, because everyone's giving it to you, Pastor. <laughs> and these three corrections, they had to come to him alone. They had to fall down. And when you get older, you think the scripture says prostate. <laughs> Let angels prostate fall. Ah, I think it's prostrate. You women don't understand that, but us men understand that. Him alone, prostrate. When it says, come bless the Lord, my granddaughter, Joelle, she came to me one time and she handed me $2. Brother McClay home. She goes, Papa, I want to bless you. And I told her, I'm worth millions of dollars, you little jerk. This don't do nothing for me. No. I am, that's my granddaughter. That's my granddaddy. <laughs> I embraced her and I said, do you realize what you just did to your grandpa's heart? Baby, that is the best gift a grandpa could ever receive from that baby. She said, I thought it was, Papa. I knew God told me to give me this. I said, you know, when I walked away, do you think $2 can sustain me? I can't even get gas now. <laughs> but I didn't let her know that. Do you think your money or whatever it is that you have, you really can bless the Lord? The only way you can bless the Lord is to fall down before him, Pastor, to him. And not say, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. What are you going to give him? What could you give a God that has everything that's self-sustaining? Jesus paid it all, and I just want to take time to say thank you, God. Thank you. And I just want to, now that it's you alone, and it's me alone, and I'm prostrate before you, would you be so kind, Lord, may I worship you today. Him alone. Prostrate. Worship. Those three prerequisites must be met before you can either bring gold, frankincense, or myrrh. Why these three gifts? Friends, gold always represents faith. That the genius of your faith be much more precious than the gold that perishes. Though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Silver is redemption. Gold is faith. He told you, Peter, go get that coin out of the fish's mouth. And when you pull the coin out, there'll be a gold coin and everything you need will be because of the faith that I put in you. It's not your faith in Jesus, it's the faith of Jesus. He gave you a measure of faith and a king is always worthy to give back to him 
the crown and the gold and the faith that he gave you. And that gold represented Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life now that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's the only way to fly, friend. The faith of Jesus. And that's the goal that these wise men knew what to bring. And they brought frankincense. And the frankincense they brought is incense that only comes, Betty, from a tree. It's not any old incense. It has to come from a tree. We used to, he gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. He gave his life. Incense that comes from a tree. It's the birth life. Paul stands up and he plays on this type of chatter. And Paul the Apostle, the wisest, probably most intellectual man that could speak every language on earth at that time after the departure of Jesus, of course. Maybe only third to Solomon. But Paul says, I beseech you, I beg you. He pours it out, even claims in one passage he'll be cursed for his countrymen to be saved. And he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you can prove what's the acceptable and perfect will of God for your life. The burnt life is reasonable. It's rational. It's your minimal devotion. If he gave his life... What more could he give? And he died, and we're happy about that. But he died that we might live, and we should be happier about that. But he died that we might live for him. For him, wise men follow Jesus. And wise women follow Jesus, and wise women follow wise men who follow Jesus. And he gave myrrh. Why myrrh? It's what you taught us, Pastor. I was 25 when I got saved. I was a baby. And you taught me the articulation of the lips. That high religious cotton, which is submission to spiritual authority, sharing what I had with others, but the sacrifice of praise. We would say, we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of God. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of Thanksgiving. And Wednesday night, we would sing that song with Wendell and his wife. They would come out of the and they would, what a mighty God we serve. I will enter his gates. And then they said, we bring the sacrifice. And when we brought praise in, it slaughtered all the worry, doubt, and fear in our life. Therefore, Jesus also, that he may sanctify the people his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifices of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Giving thanks to his name. Hey, I got Delta Knight. Delta variant. I was one of the first 100 cases. What a lottery winning pig. But I made it. God saw me through every minute of it. Amen. My number one elder in our church that's been with me the longest saint of God. He dies on January 31st. This is Chip May's shirt. Chip gave me this. I miss him as a person, but I really miss the phone calls of encouragement. When I first met him, I came out of the world and I was a gangster and a con man, a born again con man. And so when I saw Chip for the first time, he was glad handing everybody. Hallelujah. God loves you. I thought, this dude can't be real. <laughs> this can't be real. That was on Central. Then things, we all left and I thought, I went somewhere else. Then I ended up on 61st Avenue when Pastor came back from Vegas and I didn't see him. And then all of a sudden, here comes this little dude again. How are you, brother? How are you doing? God bless you. I love you. You don't know me. But you know he did. And he was consistent. And he was an encourager. And to have that phone ring now. And him tell you, Brother Monty, 
Chip may have you doing today. I just want to encourage you today, son, tell you how thankful I am for this and that, and how you, and tell me how great I was. You know how hard it is for a black skunk to receive praise from somebody? It's tough. But they would bring the articulation of praise. They would bring it in. When Samuel would go out, Tim, he would start at Ramah. He would go to Bethel, the house of God. He would go to Gilgal, the place of the Lord, the way of approach. He would go to Mizpah, that watchtower, and that place of open communication. But it says Samuel would always go back to Ramah. And he would go back to Ramah because Ramah meant the high place. Do you remember, Pastor? We place you in the highest place. For you are the great high priest. We place you far above all else. And the women would say, I beg you, like Paul, 
off to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. You say, but can't you tell, Bishop, I only got a couple years left. Yeah. If we're to give God our youth, give him the end. He's worthy of it all from start to finish. It's your minimal devotion. It's your rational response. It's your rational response. It's rational to give it back to him. Because you're going to see him anyway. Moses said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Joshua said, As for me, and my house will serve the Lord. John said, Do not love the world or the things in the world. James said, to be a friend of this world is to be an enemy of God. And Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. Would you stand with me today if you can? And let's sing. We place you on the highest place for
You can read a hundred commentaries on that and Greek reviews. It just simply means we worship Trinitarian. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existence. Jesus is not the Father, but Jesus is still God. It'll separate you from every thought pattern, religious belief system. Once, you, once Jesus is God and you still are Trinitarian, all hell will break loose with what you'll see people believe. They'll manifest on you 500 ways to Sunday and tell you about a different way. If you can't defend the faith, be quiet. Study to show yourself approved. So when they come, let God take this foolish thing and put to shame the things which are mighty. Let him take this weak thing and put to shame the things which are strong. That's how God shows off. That's who our God is. And he's going to do it in these end times, and he's doing it. I've never passed this way before. Spiritual Father, Pastor Christ, I've never passed this way in 32 years where the blessings of God were so extreme and off the chart where there's not been room enough to receive it and the persecutions of God from the, from the persecutions that were coming because of God were just as strong. Paradoxically, two mutual truths contradictory to one another walking in. Is that crazy? Usually you have a, a mountain or a valley. Not now, it's just... Wow. We bow our heads and the Lord is just speaking to you and the pastor. Who do you sit and just lift your hand? Let me pray with you right where you are. I just want to, I just want to reach out and Lord just touch you today. I just want to touch you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Many times we prayed together. Thank you, Jesus. You hear us. You hear us when we pray. Thank you, Lord. You're the Lord of all comfort. You're the God of all peace. You never forsake us. You grow sweeter every day. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Lord, touch us today. In Jesus' name. In the name of our Lord. We lift our hand. Here we are, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Jesus, I love you, Jesus. I love that song. I've been singing it Ben and I all week. I never could get the timing right. Let's try it again. You lead it, honey. Get your name out on that mic, okay?
come across him, the greatest people that have ever walked this earth. Brilliant men, women. I got saved when I was seven years old, filled with the Holy Spirit. I said, Well, I'll preach my 17 years. Started my ordination when I was 19. And here comes this cat off the streets. And look at the knowledge. Far superior than me. I'm so proud of him. I love this man. He helps me so many times. So many ways. Aren't you glad you're a part of the family of God? Look around. We need one another. We're going to make it through these days. We're going to walk through it together. God's going to help us. Go in peace. Don't walk in fear. Walk cautiously, but we rebuke the spirit of fear. Government controls with fear. And my Lord, we see it all over us. I love that analogy. You know, I've talked about Dr. Charles Kahn. He's always way back. He said, you know, we used to have revival and sin would diminish and church would come up and then hell would rise and church would fall down and said, in the last days, you're going to see it rise on both sides, just like Bishop said today. You see that. How many of you know that's true all around? The blessings of God but everywhere you look. Chaos and turmoil. And the key word Bishop said today is deception. Deception. Pray God give you a good discerning heart. Bless you as you go. It'll be a prosperous week with Jesus' help. Amen.